Now, given that we've talked about matter, which is you know the stuff that's in the universe, the next step that we need to do is to talk about energy, right? Which would be everything else in the universe. So remember that matter is anything that has mass and volume. In other words, you know things that that um, have stuff in them and that take up space. Everything else is in the category of energy. Now, if you take a physics class, they tell you that energy is the capacity to do work. So you might be saying to yourself, self. Chemistry is the study of matter, so why in the world do I need to uh, talk about energy? Well, it turns out that you really can't study matter without uh, talking about how matter is actually affected by energy. So one of the laws, probably the most important law about energy, is the law of conservation of energy. If you remember the law of conservation of mass, it says that matter cannot be created nor destroyed. So you can probably imagine that the law of conservation of energy says that energy can be neither created nor destroyed. Right? We can uh, change it from one form to another, but we cannot do anything to um, decrease or increase the total amount of energy in the universe. Now, I've tried to use this um, you know, at home. So, for example, let's say that I'm sitting on the couch eating some delicious Pop-Tarts, and my wife says, you know what, it's garbage day, so you need to take the garbage out. And we have a really long driveway, and so I don't want to, uh, to do this. It takes a lot of energy right, to do this kind of work. So I might, you know, say to her, well, you know, I don't have any energy, as you can see. That's why I'm sitting on the couch. And um, since the law of conservation of energy says I can neither create nor destroy energy, there's absolutely nothing I can do to create enough energy to take the garbage out. Now, uh, I'm correct, right? There's nothing, no way I can increase the amount of energy in the universe. Unfortunately, um, the law of conservation of energy also says that we can transfer energy from one form to another. So my wife might tell me, well, you should uh, convert some of that energy in those Pop-Tarts you're eating into some kinetic energy to actually like move the trash down the driveway, or you might as well stay on the, the couch tonight. So we're going to talk about the different forms of energy and how you can transfer energy from one place to another or convert it from one form of energy to another. Now, there are really only two types of energy in the universe. There's kinetic energy, which is the energy of motion, and potential energy, which is stored energy, sometimes called the energy of position. Now, you might say, well, what about all the other forms of energy, electrical or heat um, or nuclear energy? Well, it turns out that these are all just various subtypes of these two uh, fundamental forms of energy. Electrical energy, for instance, is just the movement of electrons through a wire moving is uh, kinetic energy, right? Heat or thermal energy is just a measure of the, the motion of, of atoms as they vibrate. Okay? Again, energy of motion is kinetic. Light energy or radiant energy uh, just has to do with electrons dropping from one energy level to another. Oh, electrons moving, energy of motion. Um, potential energy in, includes uh, chemical energy because there's uh, potential energy stored in the chemical bonds themselves as they're uh, breaking and reforming. And the nuclear energy just has to do with the strong and weak force within the nucleus itself. So again, just another form of stored or potential energy. Now, if we're going to be measuring energy, we need some units, right? When we were measuring um, you know, matter, we talked about mass and kilograms and, and meters for length and so forth. But how do you measure energy? Well, there are a couple of different units that we can use. These include calories, uh, joules, and kilowatt hours. By far the, the most common uh, two that we use in chemistry are calories and joules, but you'll probably see kilowatt hours if you ever look at your power bill, which you probably don't want to do because those keep going up. It seems like they're getting more and more expensive. Now, um, the unit calorie is kind of a funny one because a calorie, or a cal, is the amount of energy needed to raise one gram of water by one degree Celsius. So in other words, if I... Um, had a thimble full of water, which is about one gram of water, and I zapped it with, you know, one calorie of energy. It would actually heat up that water one degree Celsius. It might go from 25 to 26 degrees Celsius at that point. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean that if I um, have a Snickers bar that says 280 calories on the label, does that mean that I could actually use that energy and zap that little thimble full of water and increase the temperature by 280 degrees Celsius? Well, it turns out it's uh, even worse than that. The calories that you read on a food label are not actual scientific calories. They're actually known as uh, uh, food calories or kilocalories. Now remember, uh, from a previous section, when we said 
kilo, you know, kilograms. We said that 1,000 grams is 1 kilogram, which means that 1,000 scientific calories is 1 kilocalorie, or kcal. Um, in the U.S., we still use the, the term uh, calorie, and the nutrition people here are kind of stupid because they'll say, well, we don't want to use a kilocalorie. Maybe it, it sounds like killing or something. So um, we're just going to call it calories, but we'll use a capital C. And that way it totally makes it different than a lowercase c um, for, you know, scientific calories, which is just, you know, that's stupid. It doesn't make any sense. So I'll always refer to food calories as either food calories or as kilocalories. Everywhere else in the world, the labels will actually say kcals, which is what they are which means that if I had that Snickers bar with 280 food calories in it, if I could actually um, convert all of that to heat energy and zap that little one gram thimble full of water, I could actually um, increase the temperature by 280,000 uh, degrees Celsius, which is a lot of energy, which is pretty amazing that our bodies actually use, you know, what are we supposed to have, um, 2,000 calories in our daily diet, which is actually 2 million uh, scientific calories. That's enough energy to raise a gram of water 2 million degrees Celsius, which is, that's amazing to me. So now that we understand the fundamentals of, you know, actual uh, energy and, and using units to measure this, let's talk about uh, the potential energy that's in a reaction, okay? Because this is what we really care about in chemistry, right? So we know that a reaction is when uh, molecules or atoms collide with each other, they actually hit each other with enough energy to break bonds or they will you know, run into each other and coalesce into molecules and so forth. And there's always energy involved with each of these things. Now, um, there aren't too many always in chemistry, but these are, these are two of them. Whenever you break bonds in a reactant, it always, always, always requires an input of energy. Right? It requires energy to break the bonds. Think about atoms as you know, kind of magnets, right? So you bring these magnets together, and they cling together, right? Um, they're attracted, and it's going to require some energy to pull those apart. Now, the amount of energy can vary depending on how strong the magnets are, just like um, you know, different bonds have different strengths, and so it makes sense that it requires you know, a lot of energy to break some bonds and only a small amount of energy to break other bom bonds, but it always requires an input of energy in order to break a bond. Now, what about in the products? And in the products, we're always going to be releasing energy because we're going to be forming new bonds. And again, this is the opposite of breaking bonds. So if breaking bonds always requires an input of energy, forming bonds will always, always, always release energy. And again, the amount of energy that's released is going to differ depending on what kind of bond we're talking about. So to give you an example, we have a chlorine-chlorine single bond here. And the bond energy for this is about 58 kilocalories per mole, which means it takes 58 kilocalories to, uh, to break this bond, right? Or, in other words, if I form that bond, I'm going to release 58 kilocalories of energy per mole of, of chlorine gas. Now, um, when a, an overall reaction takes place, we're going to be breaking some bonds, forming new bonds, so we're going to be putting in some energy and releasing some energy. And if we want to look at the overall amount of energy that's either absorbed or released in the reaction, we're going to call that delta H. Right? Um, this is sometimes called the uh, heat of reaction or the enthalpy change. But again, it's given this symbol, uh, the Greek letter delta, capital delta um, H here, for the change in energy. Now, there can be two different types of reactions that might take place. Right? We know that sometimes you're going to be putting in some energy and then you're going to end up you know releasing a small amount of energy it's kinda of like when you have a, a bad business right you put in a lot of your starting capital to get it going and then you only make you know a few bucks out of it so overall that would be known as an endothermic right therm meaning heat like a thermometer um, endo meaning into and so that means that heat is going into the system so overall energy is being absorbed by the reaction now remember that some is being released, but overall we're getting a you know a net absorption of energy. So for these, we're always going to say that delta H is by definition a positive value. 
So anytime I give you delta H for a reaction and it's positive, you know right away that this is an endothermic reaction, that you're putting in more energy than you're getting back out. I always think of this as, you know, positive means you're adding energy, which makes sense in this case because you're, you have to keep adding more and more energy to get this going. An example of an endothermic reaction would be like one of those instant ice packs. Let's say that you're playing basketball and you, you know, hurt your, your wrist or something and you snap open the little pack and you shake it up and it gets cold, right? So what's happening is the, the overall um, process is absorbing energy. And so it's actually sucking heat out of your wounded wrist and into the, um, you know, the cold pack. Now the opposite of this would be an exothermic reaction. So again, therm meaning heat, exo meaning exiting. So heat is being is exiting the system, or is being released by the reaction. So again, this requires some energy to get the reaction started. But overall, we're getting a net release of energy. You can think of this as like a campfire, right? You have to put in some energy to get the reaction going. You, you know, light a match to start the wood on fire, but then once it gets going, it produces a lot of energy. So, you know, that heat is being released by the campfire. You can use it to cook your s'mores, and, you know, everybody's happy. So for this, we're going to always define delta H for an exothermic reaction as a negative, okay? Which means that overall we're, um, you know, heat is exiting the system. And remember that we're never truly losing or gaining energy. It's just being transferred from the, you know, the beaker or from the campfire to your s'mores or your poor burning hand or, you know, whatever's going on. So we're always just moving energy from one location to another. So let me give you an example of this. Right? In our, um, our little chlorine molecule from before, we said that the bond energy was 58 kilocalories per mole, which means that if we were breaking that bond, if we're cleaving that bond, we're going to say that we have to put in a positive 58 kilocalories per mole, right? So we're, it's a positive value because this is an endothermic process. We have to put heat into the reaction to break that bond. Now, if we were doing the reverse reaction and we were actually forming that chlorine-chlorine single bond, instead, we would say that the delta H for this reaction is a negative 58 kilocalories per mole because um, that much heat would be released once we form that new bond. Again, you can kind of think of this as when you have the two magnets, in order to pull them apart, you have to put in some energy, right? You have to add energy to the system, so it would be a positive delta H. If you take the two magnets and you bring them close together, they'll naturally snap together and they'll release energy, right, in the form of sound and so forth as the, as the two magnets naturally pull together. And so we would say in that case that it would be a negative delta H value. So a couple more examples real quick for you. I have here a couple of reactions and we'll go over these in you know, more detail in a different um, lecture about chemical reactions. But basically what's happening in this first one is this is methane or natural gas burning in oxygen, right, to produce carbon dioxide and water. So this is, you know, a natural, um, you know, natural gas flame, okay, and so you can probably just by, you know, what you know about this, you know that your little pilot light on your, uh, you know, natural gas stove is, this is an exothermic process, right, uh, because it's going to be pr uh, producing or releasing energy. Now, we can see that the delta H here is negative 213 kilocalories per mole. So it's a negative react or a negative delta H, which means it's an exothermic reaction, right? So we could write that this one is exothermic. Now, what about the uh, the next reaction here? So this is carbon dioxide and water turning into glucose and oxygen. If you're a, uh, a biology major, you might recognize this as um, photosynthesis, right? So this is what what leaves naturally do, okay, is they will take um, carbon dioxide and water and turn it into glucose and then produce oxygen, which is good for us because we happen to breathe that stuff. Now notice here that the delta H is a positive value, so this is an endothermic reaction, right? So this is endothermic, and in fact, uh, that's a pretty high number. That's a very endothermic reaction. And so, um, how does this reaction take place if it requires so much energy? Well, that's where sunlight comes in, right? So, the plants use the, you know, the energy from the sun to drive this reaction forward. 
So this is you know where the energy is coming from to to uh, make this reaction take place. Now, it turns out though that humans and other animals like to do this reverse reaction, right? So literally, what we will do is we will take in um, glucose, which is sugar, and then we also breathe in oxygen, and we'll actually run this reaction in the opposite direction. So we'll actually do this to produce, um, you know, water and a whole lot of carbon dioxide, which we exhale, and so we're we're going in the opposite direction, which means that if this reaction, as written, is a positive 678 kilocalories per mole, it's an endothermic reaction going in the reverse direction would actually be a negative 678 kilocalories per mole. So that's an exothermic reaction, which explains why um, we produce so much body heat, because whenever we're literally burning this sugar within our bodies, we're producing a lot of energy, which we can then you know, use for you know, moving around and um, you know, playing sports or making amazing chemistry videos or whatever we want to do. Now, to illustrate this, I actually have a quick video that I'm going to go ahead and show you um, that involves um, some actual uh, exothermic uh, cards. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and um, have you choose a card. And normally, if you were actually sitting here, I would um, have you do it directly, but you're not. So uh, I'm just going to go ahead and flip through this deck here, and you go ahead and say stop whenever you'd like to. All right, stop. So that's going to be your card, okay? And uh, I'm going to go ahead and you know leave that in the deck. And we're going to assume that you chose an exothermic card, right? So remember, exothermic means it's going to release heat or produce heat in the reaction. But even though it is an exothermic reaction and produces heat, remember that just like a campfire, we need to put in something called the activation energy. The activation energy is going to kind of get the reaction started. So I'm actually going to uh, use a, a lighter to go ahead and put in some activation energy here. And so we'll just give it just a little bit of energy. That should be enough. And you'd actually be able to feel that the, the deck itself is getting hot right, as your card starts to produce a lot of heat because, again, it's exothermic. And it's kind of hard for you to see, but I'm going to go ahead and hold these up and see if I can go through the deck. And you let me know if you happen to see uh, your card anywhere. Tilt it a little more so you can see. Okay, oh, is that your card right there? The five of hearts. And I'm going to go ahead and go through the rest of the deck so you can see that there are no other five of hearts in the deck. And sure enough, that is your card right there. Now that's definitely an exothermic card. You can even smell that it <laughs> has that nice sooty aroma. So if this were an endothermic card, obviously the card would get very, very cold, but you happen to choose an exothermic card. So now that we've seen the difference between endothermic and exothermic, let's talk about how um, energy and temperature are related. So let's take an example of, let's say that you're cooking you know, a pot of, of spaghetti or something. And so you have this big pot of water, and it's uh, you know, filled with water in here. I should probably make that blue. All right. So we've got this big pot of water here, and we're going to go ahead and heat that up. Now the actual temperature change, if you were to put like a a thermometer or something in here to measure how much um, the temperature actually changes. This would depend on several factors. The first would be the amount of energy that's actually added. We're going to call that Q. And Q is going to be positive in this case because we're adding energy to the water, right? We're heating it up as we turn on the flame and, uh, and you know, start to boil this water. If this were, um, if heat were actually being released by it, let's say that we had you know a, a really hot piece of metal and we drop it in a bucket of water to you know cool it off the metal would actually be releasing energy or losing energy and so that would be a negative q now the the next thing that will determine how quickly the temperature of our water changes is the actual mass of the water right if i only had a, a teaspoon of water in there it would obviously heat up very very quickly on the stove Whereas if I have you know, a swimming pool of water, it's going to take a long time to heat that to boiling. And then the last factor that we need to take into account is something called the specific heat capacity, or C. Now, specific heat capacity is an intrinsic or uh, an intensive 
pro uh, pro property of the uh, of the substance, and so that means that we can actually use that to identify what kind of substance we have. Now, specific heat capacity is kind of weird, but it basically determines how quickly an object heats up, right? So, for instance, um, water has a very high specific heat capacity. Metals have very low specific heat capacities, which explains why if you know we were cooking or heating up this pot of water, you could dip your finger into the water itself and it might just be lukewarm. But if you were to touch the, the pot itself because it's metal and it has such a, a you know low specific heat capacity, you would burn yourself because it, it heats up very, very rapidly. So how does this all come together into a an actual um, kind of, I don't know, um, like an equation that we can use? Well, just a, as a quick definition before we actually do the the equation itself, um, here's the full definition of specific heat capacity. The amount of energy needed to raise the temperature of one gram of the substance by one degree Celsius. So I have a table here that shows a couple of different heat capacities. So you can see that something like um, aluminum or you know uh, copper or iron all have relatively low specific heat capacities which again is why they get so hot so quickly when you put them on the stove. Notice that liquid water has an extremely high specific heat capacity, 4.184 joules per gram degree Celsius. That's incredibly high. Now, um, let's go ahead and look at the overall equation for this, and let's try working through a sample problem. So here's our formula. Q, which is the heat, equals M times C times delta delta T, which in other words, the mass times the specific heat capacity times the t change in temperature. That's important to note that it's not the temperature itself, it's the change in temperature. So let's go ahead and try to, uh, to work through one of these problems. Um, the problem might say something along these lines. I have a, uh, you know, a piece of iron with a mass of 43 grams. I have um, and I'm going to change the temperature, delta T. I'm going to go ahead and increase the temperature by 35 degrees Celsius. Okay, so I really want to heat this thing up. And I want to know, what's my value for Q? Right? What's the amount of, of heat that I need to add to this in order to, to make this temperature change take place? So we're going to go ahead and use this equation, Q equals M times C times delta T. So Q is equal to M, which is our mass, 43 grams, times C. I'm going to go ahead and pull C from this table over here, which says that for iron, C is 0.449. Notice that the units up here at the top are kind of weird. Um, they are joules per gram degree Celsius. And then um, I need to go ahead and multiply that by delta T, which in our case we said was 35 degrees Celsius. Notice that grams cancels grams, degrees Celsius cancels degrees Celsius. The only unit left here is joules, which is perfect because I want my Q, my value for Q, my heat, to be in joules. So now all I need to do is type into my calculator 43 times 0.449 times 35. The calculator spits out this answer, 675.745. My unit has to be joules, but what about sig figs, right, my significant figures? Well, this is a multiplication problem, so I need to count sig figs and then go with my lowest number of sig figs. So let's go ahead and count our sig figs here. It looks like in our first number we have 2, in our next number we have 2, and in our uh, specific heat we had 3. So our quote-unquote worst number, um, our lowest number of sig figs is 2, so we have to round this to only 2 sig figs. So I can keep the 7 and then, or the 6 and the 7 here, but I'm actually going to round that up to 680. So that gives me only two sig figs since I don't have a decimal point anymore. So that's not a significant zero there. And again, my units have to be joules. So what this tells me is if I want to heat up that piece of iron by 35 degrees Celsius, I'm going to need to add in 680 joules of energy to make this take place. So this time, let's try another one of these, but this time let's uh, switch things up a bit. Let's say that we have 
some water and we're going to go ahead and um, add let's say 55 joules of energy to this um, you know thing of water the water happens to have a mass of 4.2 kilograms and I want to know what's my delta T going to be for this for this liquid water that I have well in this case I'm going to use the same formula as before Q equals M times C times delta T it's the only formula that we you know have for uh, something that involves specific heat but um, I'm actually going to go ahead and rearrange this thing because notice that this time I have um, I have Q I have M and I have C because C comes from this table over here right but I don't have delta T so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to rearrange this I'm going to divide both sides by um, M and C so I'm going to say that Q over M times C so Q over M times C is equal to delta T for this reaction here alright so again just using a quick algebra I could have plugged in the numbers and then done it that way and it would come out to the same thing so it doesn't really matter but let's go ahead and plug things in now so delta T my change in temperature is going to be equal to Q we said that Q was 55 joules over M right? M is my mass and then uh, C is my my specific heat now notice one thing though I tried to trick you on this one because I actually gave you the mass but I gave it to you in kilograms notice on my specific heat it's joules per gram degree Celsius um, so that means I need to make sure that I change that into um, into grams right so I'm going to do a quick little domino problem here and I'm going to put 4.2 kilograms in that top box and then I'm going to go ahead and put question mark uh, grams down here in the bottom right and most of you could just do this in your head but I'm going to write it out just to remind us I'm going to say one kilogram on the bottom remember that a kilogram is equal to 1000 grams right so kilograms cancels kilograms grams cancels grams and 4.2 times 1000 is 4200 right so I'm actually going to write in on my uh, problem down here I'm gonna go ahead and write in uh, 4200 grams and then my next thing is C which we uh, found over here in our table is 4.184 the units are kind of weird joules per gram degree Celsius now notice that by being careful with my units I can actually check right here joules cancels joules grams cancels grams that means my final unit has to be degree Celsius which is perfect because that's what my Delta T should be in right so in this case Delta T is going to be equal to 55 divided by uh, I'm putting this in parentheses on the bottom 4200 times 4.184 and that comes out to a grand total of 0 0.0031 um, if I round to two sig figs so 0 0.0031 and what are my units? Uh, we said that they were uh, degrees Celsius, right? so my change in temperature for my my uh, 4.2 kilograms of water is only 0 0.0031 degrees Celsius so not even close to being a full degree Celsius change So this is a very very minor change um, because remember look at how high this value is it takes a lot of energy to change you know w even one gram of water one degree Celsius it takes a little over four joules of energy so trying to put in 55 joules into 4.2 kilograms yeah that's pretty much nothing at all so that ex um, is pretty much it for our discussion on energy. Thanks for uh, sticking with me.